Let's um, take our Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 11. And um, when we get there, we will go to the Lord in prayer. Again, I appreciate you all coming out. I really do. Um, I love the Lord's Supper. And we, here at Bethel, um, we follow the Lord's commandment to follow up communion with washing of the saints' feet. And I'll explain that here in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 11, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, um, let's keep the service solemn, and uh, let's think about all the things that Christ has done for us and reflect on those as we do what we do in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. Lord, it is a beautiful day. And we thank you for it. We thank you for springtime, for giving life back to this earth. And Father, we worship you and praise you because you take life, but then you give life. And Father, from all of us, Jesus has taught us that to give our life in service to you and to your kingdom is an honor. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of sharing in the cross with our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that although we have given our life, you then will give us a brand new life. And so, Father, that's our goal. That's what we want. That's where our heart resides. None of us here, both in this building and those in attendance with us around the world, none of us want to spend even a moment in hell. And we thank you that Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior, gave his life presented his body for the suffering of our transgressions so that we could be freed from hell's grip and have eternal life. Father, I love you. I thank you for the life that you have given me. I thank you for the life that you've given my family and the life that you have given to the people in this church. It is a life of faith. We trust you. We trust your word. We trust God that you always are good to your people. Father, always teach us that. Remind us of that. Even in our darkest days. When we don't think that we can hang on anymore. Remind us, Father. That you're the one hanging on to us. So, Father, we in this format... We share the body, the blood, and we commemorate the suffering of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our friend laid down his life for us. So, Father, we give this service and this communion in honor of him. Thank you, God, for giving us a wonderful Savior. Thank you, God, for sending us your only begotten Son. Thank you, Jesus, for being a friend to sinners. And a gatherer of all of those who are outcast. Those, Lord, that other people have rejected, you've taken in. Jesus, we thank you for that. Holy Spirit, we thank you for always leading us, always communing with us, always filling in our life with words from God's sacred book. We thank you, Holy Ghost, for correcting us, for comforting us, and for ever abiding with us. We thank you that you are the Spirit 
of God's Son, whereby we cry unto our Father, Abba. Father, we ask you bless your word as it is spoken tonight. We ask you bless the partaking of this bread and this wine in honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name and all of God's people said, Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul takes the account from the Gospels. And of course, you know, Paul was not there in the room with Jesus during the Passover. Paul was saved years later. But he was given this by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he was told what Jesus said and what Jesus did. And Paul then explains to us a little bit about the meaning of what it is that we're doing here. Remember, this is not our salvation. Our salvation lies in the real body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is a token, just as water baptism is a token. It's a symbol of what God has already done for us. And we do this in honor of Jesus Christ. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20, he said, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And apparently in the Corinthian church, they had multiple problems. But one of the things apparently that they were doing that we gather from this was they were making the Lord's Supper into a banquet. And what was happening was people who had means would bring in food for themselves while those who were poor, those who were hungry, those who didn't have anything would come and sit in the same church building and watch the rich folks eat. And Paul said, this is to your shame. Have you not houses to eat and drink in? This is not about filling our bellies. This is about honoring our Lord. So he said in verse 23, for I have received of the Lord. Remember, he was not there, but God, Jesus told him what happened. I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me in verse 25 after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now Paul says he's teaching now from the Holy Ghost what the Spirit wants us to know about the Lord's Supper. He said, for as often as ye eat this bread, and again, neither Jesus nor Paul commanded us that we must do this certain amount of times in a lifetime, certain amount of times in a year, every Sunday, every other Sunday. He just said, as oft as you do it, as you, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, our friends at the Catholic Church have taken this very thing and turned it into something that it was never intended to be. In other words, they believe that they are sacrificing Jesus all over again. And they do this. You have to figure how many Catholic churches and monasteries are there in the world. They do this thousands of times a day. Every single day. It's an abomination. They're bringing Christ to an open shame once again. So this is not a re-sacrifice of Christ. He only had to die once. This is us partaking and making a remembrance. We do show the Lord's death. He's already done this. And we do this until he, we're going to, we have to do this until Jesus comes back. Then we get to sit down and do it with Jesus in heaven. Amen. Wherefore, 
Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood, the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, listen to this, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And Paul made a comment about their church. He said, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, some of you have died because you have brought the Lord to a shame in your church. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren... When you come together to eat, tarry one for another. When we do this, we are commemorating the Lord's sacrifice, His death, His suffering, His body that was broken, His blood that was shed. But we also, according to this last verse, this is something that we do with one another. I believe it not only draws us closer to Christ, but my hope is that it has the effect of drawing us closer together. Because we all believe in the same body, we all believe in the same blood, we all believe in the same book, we're all brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, if you would. Um, Where, where did I find that at? Luke chapter 22. I wrote the verses down, not the chapter. Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> when Jesus died, he fulfilled the feast of the Passover. And so the Bible then tells us, gives us that event. This is the historical account of what Paul was referring to in verse 13 of Luke chapter 22. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you, before I suffer, for I say unto you, I will not eat, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread, verse 19, and gave thanks and break it. And gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And here Jesus gives us a promise. He did not partake of this particular Passover. He broke the bread, gave it to the disciples. He poured the cup, they shared it, he said, drink ye all of it. But he made a promise to them. His promise was, I will not do this until we all get to sit down in heaven together. Then I will drink this cup and eat this bread with my disciples. With basically his body. One of these days... What we do here, God's going to give us the blessing to be able to do this in heaven. Somebody say amen. So what I'm going to ask, I appreciate Brother Sterling, Brother John, who have uh, prepared the, what we call the elements of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine. This is not alcoholic wine it's non-alcoholic wine it is the new wine 
If there's no leaven in the bread, there shouldn't be any leaven in the wine either. Amen. So I'm going to ask Brother Sterling, Brother John, if they would come as our two deacons. Now, what our manner is, is that we will follow the format that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians 11. And that first we will distribute the bread. And when it's given to you, just hang on to it. And then when everybody has received, we'll have a moment of prayer. And this time, and I'll explain it again, this time is our reflection. It's us judging ourselves. I'm assuming that by your willingness to come here tonight, you have already done some examining of yourself and you believe that God or Christ has made you worthy of taking this communion tonight. But we typically just pause and reflect, judge ourselves, and pray, and then we'll partake. So, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I will ask first Brother Sterling if he would ask the Lord's blessing upon the bread, and then they will distribute that, and like I said, you hang on to it. Uh, those of you with children, use your judgment. I don't think it hurts anything for young children to learn to partake of this, even they, though they may not be of the age where they can be saved yet. I think it's, I think it's just good manner to, sh to teach this to them at a young age. So let's ask the Lord's blessing upon the bread, then it will be distributed, and then I will lead in prayer, then we will partake. Brother Sterling, lead us in prayer, please. Amen. Thank you. And we appreciate Alicia for making this unleavened bread for us. Once again, we appreciate those of you joining with us online, even those who are not following this service live. Um, may it be a blessing to everyone that partakes. Let's take a moment and spend some time with Jesus.
Our Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you, Lord, again for a beautiful day. And we thank you, Lord, for those who have joined with us both here and all over the world. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our hearts tonight. We thank you for the visible presence of Jesus Christ in the form of the bread that comes to us from heaven. And that is the bread of the Word of God. This is the manna that the children of Israel ate not knowing what it was. But thank you, Jesus, for opening our eyes and helping us to understand the mysteries that they could not see. That the real bread that we partake of tonight is not the bread that we hold in our hands right now. It is the bread that we have hidden in our heart. Your word tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so, Father, as we partake of this bread in our flesh, Father, may it truly reflect our taking in of the manna of the word of God in our soul. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for the suffering of Jesus. His body being bruised and lashed, crown of thorns pounded into his head. The agony of hours of crucifixion. And then his deliverance of us from death and from hell itself. So, Father, as we partake of this bread, we commit ourselves to you, to your kingdom. We commit ourselves to the word of God. We commit ourselves joining together as a unified church body. We commit ourselves one to another. Thank you, Father. We ask your blessings on this bread. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The bread in the Passover was mingled with bitter herbs. And it was to reflect the bitterness of the bondage that both the Israelites were in, the bondage that you and I have been in because of sin. Our sin caused bitterness in our life, did it not? We have been set free from that. And in the cup, once again, it is not the blood of Christ. For what is in this cup is temporary. The blood of Christ that was spilled on our behalf, the Bible says, is eternal. And it stands in heaven, both sprinkled upon the mercy seat of God itself, and also blotting out the transgressions that were written of the things that we did. So that's what this cup represents. And again, there's no leaven in the bread. And there is no leaven in the cup. Leaven is a picture of sin, guiltiness. And it doesn't take much leaven, does it? That's been removed. It's been purged. And Christ, with the blood that he shed for us, was pure blood. And everlasting blood. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll ask God's blessing upon this cup. Brother John, lead us in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for, I thank you personally for salvation. Thank you for the shed blood on Calvary. I thank you for pulling me out of that pit. You've done with all of us, Father. We 
call upon you to forgive us of our sins. You're so glorious in all that you do. We ask your blessing on this cup. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Once again, when you receive the cup, hold on to it. We'll have a moment for each one to examine himself so that we're not partaking of the blood of Christ unworthily. Brother Sterling. Let's have a moment, once again, between you and your Savior. Father, we come before you once again. We thank you for sending your son down here. It's a long way to go just to save a few sinners. It's a heavy price to pay for someone else's transgressions, but not his own. Thank you, Jesus, that before you came here, you committed yourself to following your Father. And that which you did was according to the volume of the book. It is written for you to do the will of God. Thank you for taking away the old in establishing the new. Thank you, God, for removing the curse of our first birth by giving us the blessing of the second birth. And in this cup, the wine being as red as blood is, it therefore stands as an everlasting symbol of the blood of that was sprinkled upon us, your people, to sanctify us, sprinkled on the mercy seat that our Father sits on, and then used to blot out all of our sins 
in our transgressions. What a Savior you are. Thank you, Jesus, for spilling your blood and being a willing and ready soldier to fight for those who could not fight for themselves. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for its divine power to blot away our sins and to make us all a kindred family together of the same blood. Bless this cup, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And all of God's people said, Thank you, Brother Sterling, Brother John. And now, one more thing. If you would turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. I'm not ashamed of the customs and the tradition that I grew up under as a free will Baptist. I am somewhat ashamed of what the free will Baptists have turned into. But I believe what they believe. We believe in practicing the washing of the saints' feet, and here's why. John chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, and that He was come from God and went to God, He riseth from supper and laid aside His garments and took a towel and girded Himself. And after that, he poureth water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Of course, he was referencing Judas. In verse 12, so after he had washed their feet, and taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye not what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And verse 17 says, If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, my favorite thing about this is that our Savior is and always was and always will be King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the creator of all things. And there's nothing that is made that was not made by him. Surely, he is on high and is the most high. He didn't talk about washing someone's hair. Thank God for some of us. He did not talk about washing our hands. For he would not have to stoop down to do so. He spoke of washing our feet. And in that, you have to get down on the floor. And what that symbolizes 
Jesus' willingness, even though he's master, his willingness to serve his people. And does he not do that? Every time we pray, whose name do we pray in? He's serving us as mediator. Every time we get in trouble, who is our advocate that we call upon? Jesus Christ. When our soul is hungry, who do we ask to feed us? Jesus. When we're thirsty, who do we ask to give us drink? Jesus. When we are covered in sin, who do we ask to cleanse and purify us? Jesus. He's our servant. And he's our master. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is too good to get down on their knees on the floor and wash his brother's feet. Nobody is. And what this does, this commits us as God's saints to serve not our own, but one another. Those of you at home, you can do this at home. Husband washing wife, wife washing husband, children. Get the family involved, call the neighbors. Be a servant to people. You can be a leader, but a good leader is one that serves. And I believe in serving our brethren and our sisters. Can you hear God's people say amen? I'd like for you to stand. We will have a word of prayer. Now, if you, have, if you have never done this and you're not sure about it, I understand. Again, this is not our salvation. We've already been saved. This is a choice that you make. Maybe it's new to some of you. So if you just want to come and watch, that's fine. You want to stay and participate, that's fine as well. If you're not sure about it, you've never done it before, maybe you'd like time to think and pray about it, I understand that too. But those of us who have done this before, we're committed to it, we're going to separate. The men go down to the fellowship hall, the ladies go to a room downstairs, separate one another, and we wash one another's feet. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessings. I thank you once again, those of you online. Uh, we'll be closing off the service at this point. And we just encourage all of you online, wash one another's feet. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this sacred service. I love it. I love your word. And I love what it has done in my life. It's made me a far better person than I used to be, and it's still doing it. Now, Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you, Lord, for those that they made the choice to come. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that they would find tonight a blessing. Not a necessity, not a commandment, not something that we must do in order to stay saved. But is out of our respect and our love for Jesus and what he did that we come to pay him honor and to give him the glory and the praise through this service. I pray, dear God, that you would lead us once again into the next communion service. And I pray, dear God, that one of these days we do look for the next service to be with our Savior Jesus in heaven. What a day that will be. Father, dismiss us now in your care. Bless us as we wash the saints' feet. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. God bless you. We will now separate.